best recall that by the end of the genocide in 1994, tens of thousands of children lost their mothers and fathers. Thousands of children were victims of horrific brutality. Many were forced to commit atrocities. The impact of the tragedy simply cannot be overstated. I remember it vividly, not because I was there, but because I was actually living in Bangladesh at the time with UNICEF, and there were images on Bangladeshi television, and I was sitting with Bangladeshi friends, just completely taken aback. After the genocide of Rwanda's children faced extreme challenges that we're all gathered this evening to talk about and we're well aware of. It was home to one of the greatest proportions of child-headed households in the world, either because parents were killed, died of HIV and AIDS, had been in prison for related crimes. During the five years following the 1994 genocide, 2,000 men, women, many of them who were survivors of rape, were tested for HIV, and 80% of them were found to be positive. By 2001, an estimated 264,000 children had lost one or both parents to HIV and AIDS, representing 43% of all women. According to a survey we did um, of 3,000 children at the time, 80% of them interviewed experienced a death in the family during this period of the genocide. 70% witnessed a killing or an injury. An injury. 35% saw other children killing or injuring other children, and 88% saw dead bodies or body parts. 80% had to hide for protection. 61% were threatened that they would be killed. And what's truly extraordinary, I think, is that 90% of the children we interviewed believed that they would die. What kind of world do we live in that tolerates such a thing? And this is not an isolated situation. This is a question we think about every day in UNICEF, and as John knows, among the child protection team, as we forge ahead with our work to protect children. The global statistics are arresting today. One million children live in countries and territories affected by conflict. Over a million children are trafficked annually, and that is most likely a growth underestimation. 150 million children are engaged in child labor, picking rags and heaps of garbage or down diamond in coal mines. Half of the children wasting away in detention have neither been pre-trialed nor pre-sentenced, and they often languish alongside violent adult prisoners. And here's a truly extraordinary statistic in our modern world. Right now, even as I speak, 230 million children under the age of five don't even have a birth certificate. In UNICEF, we were referred to this as something basic, your passport to protection for life. Without proper registration, the risks of being bought and sold, traffic without legal documentation, and other potential harms is great. In many instances, a missing birth certificate can mean that the child is refused a leaving certificate from school, or worse, she may not even be allowed to enroll. Thankfully, and I say this with some caution, we do not live in a world that tolerates this. A former executive director of UNICEF, James Grant, once spoke of morality marching with capacity. That is where we are in our child protection work as an extended team of governments, civil society organizations, UN agencies, and others. We have the moral and ethical authority of a growing body of international standards, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child and its optional protocol. And as a human society, we have the human and financial capacity to act. As I noted, these words are expressed with some caution. We need to do more to center the protection of children on the world stage. To use the tagline of initiative, an initiative that we launched last July on violence in children called End Violence, we need to make visible the invisible. The invisible are the horrific acts of violence committed against boys and girls everywhere in the world every day. At the same time, the invisible are the many individuals, many of you in this room this evening, and organizations committed to making a difference. Importantly, there's a strategy 
guides are being moved forward. And that strategy has two interdependent pillars. One which guides us as we strengthen child protection systems and respond with those systems to children who have been violated. And a second pillar of the strategy which, which talks about addressing underlying social norms that are positive, bringing them to light, and addressing social norms that are negative, that bring harm to children. Our community of child protection speaks a similar, if not always, the same language. And that most certainly was not the case two decades or even one decade ago. There are enormous advocacy challenges internal to the sector, and child protection advocates call for the kinds of investments that child health, nutrition, and education sectors have benefited from. And I've been talking about that here today in Ottawa. There are a couple of scholars who examine why some global health initiatives are prioritized by political leaders, where others receive little attention. And there are four major factors that appear to influence whether or not an issue becomes a global priority. These four uh, factors I want to share with you. One is after power. The second, ideas. Third, political context. And fourth, issue characteristics. All four of these exist for us in child protection today. What the sector needs is more voice, political will, and financial resources. Today in Rwanda, many young people who survived 1994 continue to suffer disproportionately from poverty, from homelessness, trauma, many have legal issues. Several of them had their deceased parents' land taken away from them when they were too young to claim it. Today the struggle of Rwanda continues and it is very much the struggle of that the children of Rwanda need to overcome to rebuild their lives and build the future of their country. Ladies and gentlemen, we must never forget what happened in Rwanda and we must lend a hand in this ongoing pursuit of a life worth living for so many. We must also remind ourselves daily that violence against children is preventable. We can do this. Please add your voice to the post-2015 discussion. Preventing violence against children must be a clearly articulated goal in whatever the goals are that the world sets for itself for the next 20 years. Thank you again for the honor of joining you this evening. John